Hey everybody, welcome to day one of our Capture One portrait tutorial series. In this series, we're going to take this image of Carly and turn it into this image of Carly, all with inside of Capture One. No Photoshop will be involved. We're going to be using a lot of different tools inside of Capture One, and we're going to break this down into several different videos because each one will cover a different set of tools or processes, and I think one arduously long video would put most people to sleep. If you'd like to follow along with this specific image, I've put a link to it down below. It's $2 and it helps Carly out here who is actually pregnant with twins. Of course, you don't need this image of Carly. You can use any raw data that you happen to have, but this will be a good one to follow along with if you're trying to fix the exact same problems, come up with the exact same solutions that we need in this specific image. So without further ado, let's get started. <music> So the first thing we're going to do is reset the image, and that's what this button up here does. It takes away all the changes and takes it back to the original raw. Remember, a raw converter does not actually modify the raw data. Raw converters are read only. So Adobe Camera Raw, which is Lightroom, or Capture One, or whatever you happen to use, is not actually modifying the raw data. Even things like white balance are not actually part of the raw data. So you can feel free to change them later, which is why raw is so powerful. So the first thing we want to do is adjust some of the things about the exposure for the image and the way it's interpreted. So I'm going to use the lens tab up here and all of these different tools may look different for you. You have different workspaces inside of Capture One, which you can use to adjust to whatever you'd like. I've saved my own workspace over time and you're going to find that you can add and remove tools quite easily here. So if you find a header of one, just right click and you can add an additional tool or you can remove a tool. And you can have the same tool on multiple tabs. You can have more than one version of the tool on the same tab. So it's super flexible and you can do anything you'd like to do with it here. Now, in my case, I'm going to start at the top and not cover every tool inside of Capture One, but only the ones that are pertinent to this specific image. So first of all, we're gonna look at the base characteristics. This is the curve that's used to interpret the data from this camera. Now, there are a few different ones that are available. And remember, they're only interpreting the data, they're not changing it. And originally, linear response, which I find is very interesting that it's included here, is what the camera actually recorded without a curve being applied to it. So when you see the preview in the back of your camera, it may be lying to you as to how bright the image actually is, where this is the image that was recorded. So you see here, I clearly could have made this exposure a little bit more aggressive and ended up with more data. But it is what it is, and it turned out pretty well. I prefer the film extra shadow as my point of departure, but again, you choose what you would like. You can always change it later. Remember this process is non-destructive by definition because we cannot modify raw data. The next thing we look at is the lens correction. Is there any light fall off that's occurring? And this could be because of lens manufacturing defects or just plain old physics. Uh, so you may choose to uh, correct this or not. That's really up to you. Uh, a more aggressive version of that is this vignetting here, but this is more of an artistic vignette and not so much a corrective vignette, which is what this would be. So the next thing we look at would be sharpening. So your default may look different than mine. I think it's like somewhere in here. To me, I really don't like any sharpening on my image. Um, now I will sharpen it depending on if it's gonna go on glossy paper or matte paper or canvas, but each one of those has a different value for sharpening. I consider this more of a pre-sharpening because we may choose to alter it depending on, again, what type of media it's going to be printed on. Now, there are some defaults up here. They do have a pre-sharpening default, um, and you can choose to use this if you would like. Um, but for my camera, I find it to be plenty sharp out of the box, and even if you print this thing huge, it's going to be fine. So I just turn sharpening off. Since we're here and we're zoomed into our eye, we can talk about white balance a bit. Now, to me, when I'm working on a portrait, white balance is somewhat artistic. It's an expression, uh, a colder or warmer tone is really up to you and your choice of style. Um, if you like to set the white point though, because you're one of those people that thinks white point has to be set in every specific image, then you can use this dropper here and you could use the sclera of the eye as a worst case, I don't have a gray card type of rescue. So that'll give you a somewhat gray interpretation. Now you can always take the Kelvin here and pull it down a bit if it's too much. That is really, again, up to you to come up with whatever tone you would like. Uh, to me, I'm just going to reset it and use the auto white balance that the camera took at the time of the exposure because to me, we're going to be changing it and color grading it anyway at a later point. Uh, so I'm not going to get all hung up on the white balance because I'm going to be messing with it. The one thing I'm going to change right now though because it bothers me is the fact the image is somewhat crooked. Uh, so when I work on a portrait, I like to have the eyes be even. And this just may be a me thing, but if you hit the R key, which will activate this straighten up here, 
um, I just use the bottom edge of the iris and then draw a line that will intersect the similar location on the other iris and that will straighten it and stop my OCD from triggering the entire time I'm working on this image. Okay, now that we have all the basics like the exposure and the image tilt out of the way, let's get to retouching. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is work on uh, removing some of the blemishes. So that's going to be the crux of today's demonstration. So we're going to focus on the healing and the clone brushes. I'm going to create a new layer for the healing tool. So if I click on that and we can zoom in to part of the image, um, I'm going to want to start to heal this. Now I am using a Wacom tablet and Capture One is unique in that it actually supports a tablet like Lightroom and other pieces of software that typically do raw conversion. Uh, to my knowledge, don't really uh, offer tablet interfaces. Uh, so uh, it has a lot more drawing feel to it. And I'll tell you, you can do without it. I mean, you can use a mouse, but later on when we get into dodging and burning and doing some of those specialized things, having a tablet is a huge plus for you. Uh, not only speed, but I think the quality of the result. Uh, so to use this tool, it's pretty simple. You're just going to click the Alt key and tap in a location where you want to sample from, and it's going to create a new healing layer for you. And then you're simply going to then color over the area that you would like to replace. And you can do this all with one sample. You can get pretty far with one, but you may need to resample at some point. That being said, if you move this now, you'll see that all these points all move according to the location of where the source was being done. So it's to your benefit to not use this everywhere. If you need to make a new one, just alt click and it'll create a new one and then you can continue working on another side of the image. Don't feel that you have to try and use as few as possible. Uh, there is no limitation now. It used to have a limit, uh, but that has since been erased. That's not saying that there aren't performance issues if you do a ton of these. Uh, so I wouldn't go gangbusters with them, but you can still get away with quite a few on any specific image. I've really never run into a problem. What you want to do here is you want to replace parts of the image that might be difficult to replace in other ways. Uh, for example, if you were to brighten or darken or change the hue or saturation of something, would it go away? Uh, for example, this red in her eye is probably going to be a lot of work to get rid of using other methods. So I think it's a good option to try and remove it using one of the healing tools here. So I'm going to look for marks that kind of fall into that classification. So for example, this bright spot here, uh, there's nothing where I could really do to darken that enough, so I'm going to go ahead and replace it. These other little pieces of makeup, glitter, or what have you need to be removed. Now this red spot here, we could remove by removing the red, and then we would have something that looks like all the other freckles around it. Um, however, I can also just take this opportunity to brute force remove it if I would like. Again, that is your call, uh, depending on how much time you have and how much effort you want to put into a specific image. So if we just go around the image and remove these obvious ones and creating new source locations when we need to, we can remove a lot of the glaring errors in the portrait. For example, this line here, um, I can go ahead and create a new sample and then go ahead and replace that with the area next to it. And it should all look good. So the clone tool lives here and it works in a very similar way, but it does not do as much uh, replacement of the End result. So for example, if I clone into this spot here, um, I may create a situation where it's lighter or darker um, and it won't be as friendly to merge into where we're going, uh, but it's more of a direct copy. Uh, so I'm going to use that here for this tear duct so I can sample from back here. And then again, being on a parallel line with that, I can replace that texture there. If you mess up, you can again, click on one of these orange things to change it. Um, for example, changing its source location and so on. So you don't get such a tiled appearance. You want to be aware of that. And you can switch back to the uh, other the other healing layer here at any time if you want to go back into your healing mode. Um, and you're going to be hopping around in a lot of these different tools to fix different things. And again, it is based on how much time and effort you want to put into an image. If it's going to be printed small, for example, or something you're just going to throw up on Instagram, then you may not even want to take this much time to do this type of retouching to it. I'm not a good candidate for your time, in other words. But if it's be printed large or hung on a wall or for a client that's paying a lot of money for it, then obviously you want to take time to do it the right way. So I won't belabor this process, but uh, you get the idea. Now, if these points bother you and you don't want to see them anymore, you can actually hide them by going up into Layer, Display Arrows, and it will remove them. Now, if you're not hovering over the image, by the way, it typically removes them for you. Uh, so you can move off and then back on the image to be able to see them. I typically don't need to see them because I don't plan to go back and change them. But if you'd like to, then there's your option. By the way, when you're using this tool, if you right click, you can change the size of the brush, 
the hardness of the edge, the opacity, and the flow. Um, I typically use opacity at 100%, but I might lower the flow if I'd like to work in a slower pace. For these two tools, I don't tend to adjust either one. Um, I either want full coverage or no coverage, so I leave the, full, the flow at 100%, and that's about it. The one thing to keep in mind as you're doing this process is that this is probably the only destructive process, meaning as we're working with the texture of her skin, the healing and clone brushes both interrupt the natural texture and replace it with something else. Our other processes we're going to work on don't do that. I'm pretty cautious when I use the healing and clone brushes in general. Um, stray hairs and things like that, sure. Uh, eyelashes fall off from makeup. That's the fancy word for makeup that's actually not attached to the eye, but has fallen to the cheeks below it. Things like that. Uh, pimples, I'm kind of a coin toss on, depending on how bad the pimple is. I may or may not use this method. I may use other methods. But just remember, this process here is probably the only destructive one. As we work on other processes and techniques later on, you'll find that mistakes made here can have ramifications later. But what's great is we can always go back and change it because it's all raw data. We're not doing anything to uh, the actual underlying data. We're just changing things on top of it. Practice, 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 and go through and do what you'd like to do to this image. Kind of get used to using the tools, changing the brush sizes, deciding how you can best remove, say, stray hairs and other things like that, um, how the brush behaves, uh, what you can get away with as far as creating samples or sources, how many samples can you get away with from one source and so on. And just getting used to the tool and comfortable with the tool. So practice, practice. And then with the next video, we're going to pick up where this one left off and we're going to go on to another technique. So if you uh, followed along so far and you haven't shut this off, uh, we're going to use the hashtag retouching with Scott. And I'm going to put that up um, on Instagram or something like that. And if you're working on this image and you have questions or you want to show me what you've done and your amazing artwork, uh, feel free to use that hashtag retouching with Scott. And uh, we can all kind of share in this process as we go through it. Um, I also have a Facebook group for uh, Capture One users called Starting Out with Capture One. If you want to join that, uh, you can also show some of your images in there. And if you have any questions. So I will catch you guys next time. Everybody stay safe.